words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find favor before you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. I think they left a little footstool up here for me. Um, last night, I was, before dinner, I uh, was uh, sitting and kind of polishing what I'm about to share with you this morning. And Peter was sitting there, our son, yes, our son is still home from spring break. It's the, the number in the school break. Um, and I said, Pete, let me read this gospel to you. Tell me what you think. So I read the gospel that we just heard. And he very politely looked at me and said, what? <laughs> well, this is all my college tuition dollars at work, uh, but not really. It's a very complicated gospel story this morning. You know, we're listening to John. John's the theologian. You know, there's always a lot more to meets, that meets the eye when you read John's gospel, right? He's the theologian. He's the one who kind of goes most deeply into the life and theology of Christ. And he's trying to share with us a lot of images about who Jesus is, the Lamb of God, the anointed, the teacher, the rabbi, all those things that we all know that Jesus is and who Jesus is. And yet, there's the second part of the story that I think is the most important. So I'm going to leave the first part of the story away and just kind of focus on the bottom part, the second part. Yeah. Last week, Father Bob mentioned the epiphany season, and we're going to be talking about the attributes of God. Last week, God is love and, and the one who kind of assesses and judges us. And this week, we're going to encounter the love of God in Jesus as the one who is the inviter, the one who calls to us to follow him. We're going to kind of look at our responsibility because all of our lives, from the moment we, we, we came up out of those waters of baptism, right, our lives were focused on doing good. That's our Christian call, to be for others for good. And if you look at the core of the story, there's a there's a basic conversation here, right? What are you looking for? Where do you live? Come and see. So I want you to remember those three phrases for, for the remainder of the next half an hour that I'm going to be speaking. What are you looking for? Where do you live? Come and see. These are the fundamental building blocks of relationship, aren't they? Right? If you look at your friendships, you look at your marriages, you look at your your communities that we that we interact in, that's the basis of it. What are you looking for? Where do you live? Come and see. They're initially kind of transactional, right? We're kind of revealing a little bit of ourselves to each other. I see this in the couples that I work with who are getting married. I see as they mature in the relationship, they're revealing themselves to each other little by little. And so finally they're able to make that big commitment. That, that major public commitment of their love for each other to be husband and wife, to be husband and husband, wife and wife, whatever, whatever the relationship is. It goes from transactional to transformational. What are you looking for? What do you live? Come and see. I want to call to mind this morning a couple of people, two people, both the name of Francis. One is from one of my favorite books. Uh, it's something I do not want you to run out and buy because it's a really bad science fiction book. And I'm not going to share a whole lot of the story. But the, the Francis is Brother Francis of Utah, Francis Gerard of Utah. It's in a book called The Canticle for Leibowitz that was written in the late 1960s. It's kind of an apocalyptic story. I and mean, you know, Christine hates these books, but I read them anyway. Um, because I just find them entertaining. The, the book and this figure in the story, science fiction, set about 800 years in the future. It's about a civilization that's rebuilding itself after war has pretty much obliterated humanity. I love this stuff, sorry. <laughs> Brother Francis belongs to a group of monks whose sole task is to preserve books and manuscripts called the memorabilia, the good book. These are writings that have survived the prior age. Most books and all knowledge has kind of been destroyed. The 
because people became fearful of science because it was ultimately, they think, responsible for humanity's destruction. Its founder is this Jewish scientist, Isaac Edward Leibowitz, who becomes a Catholic monk and priest. And there's not enough evidence yet that he's going to become a saint, but Francis is very hopeful for this. So he's a young novice. He's 17 years old. He's out in the desert praying to God for, for insight and transformation in his life. And he finally has the opportunity. He's living those lines. What are you looking for? Would he live? Come and see. He meets a traveler on the road who's walking toward the abbey for retreat. And the traveler leads Francis, Brother Francis, to a ruin that reveals specific pieces of memorabilia about the founder of the order that ultimately leads the order to make him in the church to make their founder a saint. There's a lot of stuff in there. I'm not going to go into more detail. Please don't go buy the book because it's terrible. But it's, it's a great relationship story about this young man who is striving to be his best self. He wants to do good for the world that's becoming awakened again. And I couldn't help but see back in the dark ages when I was in seminary that my saying myself in that young man. That 17, 18 year old young monk that was looking for something in his life, something good to do. There's another Francis, and this is the one everybody knows Francis Bernardoni, Francis of Assisi, who is very close to my heart, and I know close to many of you here as well. Another strong personality, Francis of Utah, fictional, Francis Bernardoni, very, very historically real. And Francis, again, a young man seeking to do good in the world, rich dad and mom, goes off to war, gets captured, gets sick, comes home, has a conversion, and begins to explore what his life is to be. He wants to be more than what his society is telling him to do and to be. He wants to be for others, he wants to do good for others. And he has this conversion experience where he hears God's voice speak in his head and said, Francis, go rebuild my church. So what does he do? And you know the story. He goes, steals money from his father. Don't ever do that. Steals money from his father, buys some bricks, and starts rebuilding the chapel of San Damiano. He gets it wrong. Time. That's not what the call to goodness was about. This is not about rebuilding church brick by brick, but instead, as Francis comes to understand in his life, it's about rebuilding person by person. There's a line in many of the biographers of St. Francis that talk about the Lord, Francis saying, the Lord gave me brothers. Because in, in his searching, in his kind of telegraphing this, what do you, where do you stay, where do you live, come and see, he began to become attractive to other people because his quest for goodness was so strong that the Lord, in fact, did send him others, brothers and sisters, to become his followers, to transform the church in an age that was quite destitute and quite, frankly, evil. What are you looking for? Where do you live? Come and see. And slowly over time, over 800, 900 years, this Franciscan movement has left the confines of this religious order, and the, Fran the spirit of Francis has become something so much more as a force for good in our world. Many of you share that spirituality, whether in name or in, whether you're aware of it or not, by the, the, the good, wonderful stuff that happens in this place. Francis was willing to keep his heart open, as that young fictional Francis was as well, to listen to how God was working in his life. It's never over. It's never done. It's always and will always be an ongoing process. And just to add one more concept in here, because there aren't enough yet. If you 
know the musical Wicked. I haven't seen the show, don't have any desire to see the show, but there's one song in the show that I really love. And a part of it, it's a, it's a duet between the Good Witch and the Bad Witch, Bad Witch Glinda and the Felba. And I'm just gonna read a couple of lines from, this, from, this, from this, these lyrics. They sing to each other, I've heard it said that people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn, and we are led to those who help us most to grow, if we let them, and if we help them in return. But I don't know if I believe that's true, but I know I'm who I am today because I knew you. Who can I say if I can change for the better? But because I knew you, because I knew you, I've been changed for good. This is the transformational nature of community. Because all of us in this room, every week, those of us who are here today, those who, who come and go from week to week, have heard those questions, those statements. Who are you? Where are you going? Where do you live? Come and see. This is the ebb and flow of what makes community work. If we're facing a challenging time ahead of us, an exciting time when our parish is going to be re reconfigured, our ministries re-energized, as we look ahead to our parish meeting next week, is an opportunity to really see the goodness that is embedded in this place. And I hope you never ever forget that. It's a this is a remarkable community whose goodness goes far beyond things that we can see. So my friends, I wonder what Jesus continues to invite us into. In what ways does he want to share his life with you? How might he be offering himself to you? How might he be asking to, for you to participate in God's divine life? So look at your life. What do you see? And what is it like? Is it full and abundant? Come and see. Is it empty and desolate? Come and see. Is it filled with change, chaos, or the unknown? Come and see. Is it a life of joy and celebration? Come and see. Is it, do you feel lost? Is it smooth sailing? Come and see. Is it weighed down by guilt or shame or despair? Come and see. However you might describe your life, Jesus' response is always the same. Come and see. Every life, every situation reverberates with Christ's invitation to be with him, to come and see where he lives. He's there offering himself as the first-hand experience of our truest self, of our best life. Don't just take my word for it. Don't believe it because I've said it. Just get up, look at your life for yourself, and realize a tremendously good 